James chapter four, let's jump in. I got a lot of uh, space I wanna cover today. I talk at 1.5 speed, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna try to keep up, you gotta keep up, you gotta decide now. And uh, James chapter four, here's what he writes. He says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. While you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray together. Heavenly Father, we just ask today that you would speak loudly, speak clearly. As I pray often, Lord, I ask that I would decrease today and that you, Jesus, would increase. My words that are full of my thoughts and my wisdom, I ask that they would fall to the ground, but your word, I pray that it would pierce our hearts, that it would reign and endure forever, that it would change us. We know that your word can challenge us, shape us, mold us more into the image of your son, Jesus. And that's what we ask today. And so today, right now, as a church, we say, convict us, Holy Spirit, challenge us, Holy Spirit, encourage us, Holy Spirit, and show us where we need a new perspective today to change our hearts, to change our minds. And God, we trust you. We believe you for all these things. We pray this in Jesus' name and the becoming church said together. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat today. Well, when I was about 18 years old, uh, I was dating a girl and was over at her family's house for dinner one night. And just before we wrapped up dinner, her dad, who was a nice man, a, a pastor, you know, a kind man, but also an equally intimidating man. I was very afraid of this guy. He taps me on the shoulder just before dinner ends, and he says, hey, I want to talk to you in the living room. And all of a sudden, my heart just dropped into my stomach. I started thinking about everything I had ever done wrong in my entire life. And I was like, what does this guy know? We go into the living room, and even to strike more fear into me, I walk in, and he's standing there with his hand behind his back, and I'm like, surely there's a weapon. He's going to try to kill me, and he pulls his hand out from behind his back. He was not holding a weapon, but he actually was holding a gift, and the gift was wrapped in such a way and shaped in such a way that I knew it was either a DVD or a book. This was 2007. We were still watching DVDs. Some of y'all Gen Z don't know about DVDs, and it shows. It does. So I was hoping, man, I was... I was like in my heart, I was like, I hope this is Shrek 2. Come on, be Shrek 2. And I opened the DVD up or opened the present up and it wasn't a DVD. It was actually a book and one that some of you might be familiar with. It's a book by a well-known pastor and author named John Piper. And the title of the book was Don't Waste Your Life. I gotta be honest, the moment I saw this title in the context that I was in, I was kind of offended on the inside. I was like, what is this man trying to say? I was like, I'm about to have to front on and fight a grown man in his own home. So I'm like pulling my sleeves up, getting ready to take this guy on. You know, as I began to read the book, though, I did realize quickly this was not meant to be an insult, but rather a great inspiration for my life. And, you know, the, the title of the book, though, begs an interesting question. And the question I have for you today is this. Is it possible to waste your life? Some of you who are more driven, type A, Enneagram 3, achievement oriented. If you're in the room, you're like, of course it's possible to waste your life. If you're not going and growing, running and gunning and doing great things and achieving stuff, then you're, you're wasting your life. But I want to argue today that really it's only possible to waste your life if you live with the wrong pursuits. And the only way to ensure that you have the right pursuits in life is that you have the right perspective on life, right? Our pursuits are directly tied to our perspective. So I think what James is doing is he's showing us how to live not from an earthly perspective, but to live from a kingdom perspective. How many of you know what, we got to get a little bit of kingdom perspective? We got we to transcend and gain some kingdom perspective. You know, most people are grasping for control in life. Most people are pining after success. They're pursuing pleasure and living for the moment but I'm here to tell you today that kingdom people live differently. We don't live like everybody else. We don't live like the world because we were not made for this world. We were made for the kingdom of heaven. And so James wants to bring a few things into view. And I believe what he's going to do today is he's going to challenge the way we view our life. And as a result, it's going to change the way that we live our lives for the better. And so I'm going to go on this journey. And I just want to track back through 
what we read a few moments ago and show you a few things that James, I believe, wants to give us an elevated perspective on. The first thing that he says is this. I believe James is telling us that we need to live in view of God's sovereignty. In James 4, going back to verse 13, he says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there and carry on business and make money. And now I want to skip down to verse 15. We will come back to verse 14 in a moment. He says, instead, what you ought to say is if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Now, this is kind of confusing when I read it. So I read this and I'm like, okay, why does it seem like James is coming so hard at people who are just trying to make plans? Now, I want to ask by some crowd response, how many of you are planners in the room? Any, we got any planners in the room? Okay, we've got a lot of them in the space. Now, some of you that are planners, like you have your whole week already mapped out. You know, your, your schedule, you block schedules so you can maximize time. You can be more efficient. You know what you're doing this month. You don't just have a five-year plan or a 10-year plan. Some of you guys have like a whole life plan. Like I already know where this whole thing is going. And then on the other side of that, there's some of you that you don't even know what you're going to do tomorrow. You're going to wake up tomorrow and not even know what day it is. Like life is just one big mystery to you. And you're like, I'm just taking it as it comes. Now, if that's you, you're probably feeling a little justified right now because what you're thinking is, well, James just said that planning is boastful, arrogant, and evil, and this is what I've been trying to tell people all along, right? I've been trying to tell you people that by my not planning, I'm just being more like Christ. You got to give me a break here. You obviously don't trust God if you're planning all this stuff. Now, it can seem a little bit like this is what James is saying because this is some basic stuff. He's like, woe to you who like, are talking about what city you're going to go to and where you're going to do some business and make money, and I'm like, are we not all doing that all the time? And so we come to this, we have to kind of figure out how we're going to conclude what he's saying. And I want to argue that that's not really what James is getting at, that it's somehow sinful or evil or not pertinent in our life to make plans. I say that first and foremost, because if that's our conclusion, that would be inconsistent with the whole of scripture. And I just want to encourage you becoming church for a moment, that if you ever read something in scripture that's kind of perplexing or it's confusing, it causes your head to tilt for a second and you're like, I'm not sure what to make of that verse or what I just read there, can I just encourage you, please do not take that verse and suddenly start to build out an entire theology and doctrine and a new denomination of Christianity, as many people have done, but seek to understand that confusing verse in its context of the whole of scripture. We have to be people that do not just pick and choose verses, but understand the entire context of the word of God. So as we zoom out, and we get context, we just go to one book of the Bible. We open up to the middle, to the book of Proverbs, and very easily we can see that Proverbs is teaching us repeatedly to be measured, to be prepared, strategic, and to seek wise counsel when making plans. Proverbs shows this over and over again. It's okay to make plans. That there's actually wisdom in that. There's actually some godliness in our preparation. Proverbs 21.5 says this, the plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes to poverty. And so James' issue, this is what I really need you to catch on with really quickly. James' issue is not with people making plans. He's taking issue with people who make plans that do not consult God. He says, we got a lot of people planning, and they're not thinking for one moment about what does God think about what I'm planning with my life. So let me say it this way. James doesn't take issue with people creating a plan He's taking issue with people who are craving control. Now, I know for some of you, that gets real personal real quick. And you're like, hold up, Brandon, I don't even know you. And you just opened the front door of my soul. You're on my front lawn. Tread lightly, my friend. And some of you take issue with that, right? Because we do as humans. We crave control. And we do this because whether you realize it or not, the desire for control is baked in to our sinful and fallen human nature. You know, St. Augustine is one of my favorite early church authors to read, and he wrote something really fascinating that I came across a few months ago, and St. Augustine basically was reminding us, as many of us know, that as humans, we are created in the image of God. Maybe you know the phrase, the Imago Dei, that there's something about how you were formed and how you were created that in and of itself, it bears witness to God. We are created in his image, and not only are we created in his image, but we are meant to reflect that image to the world around us, which means that people should be able to know more of what God is like and who he is simply by looking at 
you. Right, so we're made in the image of God, made to reflect God, but then Augustine writes about how sin always is doing that thing that sin does. And what sin does is it mutates what God creates. And so it takes good things and it twists them to turn them into evil things. And so now because of sin, and even, even in our sin as the image of God, we now seek to resemble God, but we seek to resemble him in a sinful way. Now I wanna help you make sense of what I'm saying. I'm gonna take you on a brief theological journey, and so hop on the bus and let's go together, all right? And so mo- throughout the last centuries, many historians, theologians, Bible commentators have liked to divide the character and nature and attributes of God into two primary categories, what they call the communicable attributes of God and the incommunicable attributes. Now, if you are in the medical field, or maybe you just have a good memory and you remember a little bit of what you learned in biology in high school or college, you can kind of understand this from uh, what are called communicable and non-communicable diseases. Communicable meaning things that are spreadable, things that are contagious and can be passed from one person to the next, and non-communicable meaning the opposite. It might be a disease, but it is not transferable to the next person or to anybody else for that matter. This theological concept carries that same idea, that there are certain things about God that we can catch, that can be transferred from him to his creation, and then there are certain things about God that no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we want it, that we cannot catch those attributes of God. Now, again, I want to break this down even further. Well, you might be asking, well, what are the communicable attributes of God, the things that we can catch. Well, I think when you look at God and his character, these are the things that we can take on. Things like the mercy of God, the love of God, the justice of God, the kindness, the joy, the hope that God is known for. When I think of all of these words, my mind always goes right back to Jesus, who Hebrews tells us Jesus was not just an image of God, but he was the image of the invisible God. You know, I've heard it said before, church, that if you want to know what God is like, look no further than Jesus. He will show you the character of God just in who he was and in how he lived. Now, here's what's great. Because of salvation and because of the continuing work of the Holy Spirit, we are able to catch and grow in these attributes and characteristics of God. And so through a lifelong process called sanctification, which is that process of us becoming, shout out becoming church, let's go, becoming more and more like Jesus, formed into the image of Jesus progressively and in a greater sense throughout the course of our life. And this comes only through what? The power of the Holy Spirit and practice. We can become like, Je- we can become like Jesus. We can become like God in his communicable attributes. Well, then the second part of this, the incommunicable attributes of God, These are the things that we cannot catch, that we cannot become like, because these attributes belong to God, not so much in his character, but in his nature. And so the main thing, this is is the main thing I believe that differentiates us from God, that though we were created in his likeness, we have to remind ourselves that he is the creator and we are the creation, that he is infinite and we are finite. And so we can become like God in his character, but we cannot become like God in his nature. And so the incommunicable attributes of God, what are, what are these? What do these look like? Well, these are things like the omniscience of God, the fact that he is all-knowing. I know there's probably some of you in here, or maybe you're sitting next to somebody right now who thinks they're omniscient, right? You think you're all-knowing, but can I just set you free today? You're not. And remind yourself of that daily, and it will set you free from the burden of having to know everything all the time. God is omnipotent, which means that he is all-powerful. There is nothing and there is no one greater than God. There never has been. And the good news is there never will be. The Bible teaches us that he is, omnis- or he is omnipresent, meaning that this is an amazing thought. He is fully here and yet fully everywhere all at once. And then maybe another term that you're less familiar with, which a lot of theologians refer to as the aseity of God. This is a Latin term basically meaning that God is self-existent or that he is self-sufficient which this means that nothing created God and nothing can uncreate God and there's, there, he needs nothing, he has no dependency and God is utterly and absolutely sovereign and free. These are the incommunicable attributes of God. But here's the problem. If you'll go back with me all the way to the beginning in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve are deceived by the serpents and here's what happened. 
under the influence of the serpent came one of the most damning and pervasive ramifications of sin entering the world and subsequently humanity. And it was this, that we no longer care to resemble God in his character, but we seek to resemble God in his nature. We don't just want to be like God in his love and his justice and his mercy and his grace. No, we want to be like God in his knowledge and in his power and in his presence in the earth. And so humans, whether knowingly or unknowingly, seek not to be like God, but we seek to be as God. And we are made in his likeness, but we are pursuing him and trying to be like him in the wrong ways. We desire power. We desire knowledge. We desire control. I don't know if you think like this in the front of your mind or you verbalize these things, but a lot of us, at least somewhere in our subconscious, this is how we think. We think like this. Well, I make my own decisions. I determine what is right for me. I determine what is right for my family. I go where I want to go and I do what I want to do, essentially saying, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. You know, ironically, the man who wrote those words, Ernest Henley, he fell, he fell out of a railway car got an injury, his injury caused his tuberculosis to flare up and he died a short time after. I don't tell you that to mock this man, but I tell you that to remind you of the reality that church, we are masters of nothing. We, I am not the captain of my soul, I am not the master of my fate, but I serve the one who is. God is sovereign, he is over all things and above all things, and I am not. And the sooner we realize that, the better. Charles Spurgeon the great preacher, he said, there are two great certainties about knowing, two great certainties about things that shall come to pass. One is that God knows, and the other is that we don't know. So when it comes to our future, we don't know what's gonna happen, but here's the beautiful thing, God knows what's gonna happen. And so we don't look within ourselves to figure out where we're going, we look to the only one who actually knows where all this is going. We surrender ourselves to God, and we remind ourselves consistently and constantly that God is sovereign. But sadly, and unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians, okay, hear me when I say this, a lot of Christians who have taken on this mentality of what I call personal sovereignty. And so what we do as people who claim to follow Jesus, to be submitted to the will of God, we claim to be these things, yet we go on living and planning and deciding and doing with little to no thought as to where God might be leading us. And so rarely are we seeking the will of God or returning to the word of God or consulting the people of God. You know, many Bible commentators have referred to this way of living. It's kind of a fascinating concept as what they call practical atheism. Now, what is atheism? Atheism is there's no God. I don't believe in God. So therefore, I'm going to live as if God doesn't exist. But practical atheism or what others have called Christian atheism is belief in God, but living as if he doesn't exist. And this is a weird state for Christians to get to, that we would claim that there is a God that I've surrendered my life to, but then when we look at our life, when we, when we leave this church building today, can I ask you this? Is the reality of God going to impact anything that you do or plan or decide throughout the course of the next six days? Or is this really the only moment that we think about God? Is this really the only moment that we worship God or consult God or pray to God? Is the reality of God shaping your life? Is the reality of God informing your daily decisions, how you think, how you're interacting with people, how you're showing up to work, your relationships, whether you're dating or you're married, you know, does it impact the reality of I'm going to move from this city or I'm going to stay here? Can I ask you, have you consulted almighty God? Do you think about God? Is he the one who is determining the course of your life? Because church, if I can be honest, it is weird for us to say that we have a relationship with the omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient creator of the universe, and yet that has no real bearing on how we live our life and how we make our decisions. James says this should not be. In verse 15, he says this, he says instead, instead of just going and planning and doing your thing, what you ought to say is if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Now how does this actually play out? Like if it's God's will, does this mean that if somebody invites you to lunch right after the service, that before saying yes, the way you have to respond is, well, I'll go if the Lord wills. And they're like, it's around the corner. It's like just like a block from here. You're like, we don't know what might happen from here to that Wendy's over there, right? We don't, we don't know what might take place. Let me, let me help some of the introverts in the room. The next time somebody invites you to a gathering with other humans and you don't want to be there, the social gathering, that's not my thing. All you have to say is this, I'll be there if it's God's will. And then when you inevitably don't go, it's not your fault. 
you can blame it on God. It wasn't part of his plan. Otherwise, I would have been there, right? Just trying to get some meat to the introverts for a moment. Just trying to help everybody in this space. But in all seriousness, James is saying that our entire lives, the big decisions and the seemingly small and insignificant, all of it is meant to come into submission to the will of God. Submission literally means to come under the mission. That's all we're trying to do. It's not live for me and my mission, but I want to live for him and his mission, which is what the redemption of humanity and the renewal of the world. That's what my life is about. That's why God has placed me here. If I don't know what to do or where to go, I can always go back to, then what can I do today to be a part of God's plan for the redemption of humanity and the renewal of this world? That's why I'm here and that's why I'm about. So we come under him. Now, I'm gonna do this really quick then we're gonna move to the next point. I think I'm gonna take a moment, just we're gonna do this uh, partic full participation. We're gonna really quickly resign from a job title that many of us have been carrying. So do this with me. Let's do it right the first time. I was a youth pastor for a while, so I will make us do it again if we have to, okay? Everybody hold up your right hand. Hold up your right hand with me. And say this like you mean it. Say I. State your name. Hereby resign as ruler of the universe. Doesn't that feel great? Way off your shoulder. It's not on you. Somebody needs to hear that today. Your success in life, your significance in life, the, the future of your life, it's not on your shoulders, it's on God's. He is sovereign. The second thing that James invites us to do to gain a greater perspective in life is to live in view of our own mortality. I wonder how many of you walked into church today thinking, man, I really wanna talk about dying. He wants us to live in view of our own mortality. In verse 14, he says, why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? Says you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Now, again, this is frustrating from James because he asks probably the most provoking question you can ask a human being, which is, what is your life? Essentially, what is the meaning of all this? What is the meaning of your existence? And then before we even get a chance to answer, he says, I'm just gonna go ahead and answer for you. Your life's a mist. It's here one moment and it's gone the next. So that means that Everything in your life that you love and that you care about and that you stress about, that you're striving for, you're going for, you're gunning for, James says, you wanna know what all of that amounts to? Let me show you what that is. So that's, that's what you got. That's your life. I know some of you right now are thinking, Brandon, that's not good for my self-esteem right now. I came to church today to hear that I'm special and significant, not that I'm a miss that's here one moment and gone the next. Some of you right now, you're arguing with me in your mind. You're like, well, Here's the reality, man. You don't know that I'm kind of a big deal. I work a very important job. People report to me. I'm making a lot of money. I'm doing significant things in our nation to help the government. You know, I'm doing some pretty real stuff with my life. This, my job's a pretty big deal. And James say, he would say, you wanna know what I think about your big job? That's what I think about your job. Some of you are arguing with me, saying, you know, you don't know this, Brandon. My family's got some longevity to it. My mima, my grandma, she lived to 107 years old. My family lives to triple digits. Man, I'm gonna probably live to over 100. And James, okay, fine. You wanna live over 100? That's what you got. That, that's what this looks like. And you know, I, I tell you this today, and, and here's the thing. To encourage you for a moment, James is not trying to use this analogy or illustration to tell you that there's a futility to your life, but rather that there's a fragility to your life. Your life is important. Your life is significant, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that there is a brevity to all of this, that there is a fragility to everything that we know and love and hold dear. We don't even know if we have tomorrow, and to be honest, we don't even know if we're guaranteed the rest of today. You know, most of us in this room, we have some understanding of loss. You know, I've lost three out of my four grandparents so far, and I got to hold the hand of my grandfather as he passed from this life into the next. You know, others of you know the feeling, not just of loss, but of that unexpected loss. The kind of loss that just took the breath out of you, that took your feet out from under you. Somebody that was way too young, or an unexpected tragedy, and you got that phone call, you got that information. And it's in moments like that, that I think that we are reminded, forcefully reminded, about the brevity and the fragility of all of this. I don't know about you, but anytime I'm at a funeral, or any time that I get news of somebody that has passed, whether expected or, or not expected, I suddenly start to think about my own life. Every funeral I've ever attended, as we're talking about this person, I start thinking about me. I'm like, what, what am I doing? Where is all of this going? And I, I get a little bit stressed out, to be honest, because I'm thinking like, okay, this, this could be me at some point sooner than I think. And I read an article a while back in The Guardian called Doubting Death. 
And in it, they write about how studies have shown that the human brain shields us from existential fear by categorizing death as something that only befalls other people. So your brain tricks you. Even when somebody else dies, your brain likes to tell you, okay, that happened to them, but that's probably not gonna happen to you. Or there was a freak accident, but that, that can't happen in your life. One of the researchers said the brain simply does not accept that death is related to us. And then herein lies another significant problem, that even when we do think about our death, we think about it as some far off thing, right? If we did a thought experiment saying, hey, um, think about the moment that you're, you're gonna pass from this life to the next. I think most of us would think of, you know, being older, later in years, laying in a hospital room or in a bed in our home, maybe friends and family surrounding us in that space. And so even in those moments that we do think about our dying, it's not something that could be now. It's not something that could be soon. It's something that we push off as a distant thing. This is why Proverbs 27.1 uh, says this, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. We don't know what's gonna happen today. We don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And so because we think of everything as far away, what do we do as humans? We plan and we live our lives and order our lives by months and years and decades, right? So we celebrate anniversaries and we celebrate important birthdays and decades by making these certain milestones. But the Bible consistently teaches us to understand and appreciate the value of a day, not just a decade, not just that you made it another year, but that you made it another day. Moses tells us in the Psalms, in Psalm 90, verse 12, he says, Holy Spirit of God, teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. You know, I wanted to be wise this week, so I went on Google, and I just typed in, how long have I been alive? And I found a little tracker, and I put in my birthday. I just turned 35 on Friday, and I found out that today I have been alive 12,786 days. I actually thought it was gonna be more. And I'm like, you know what? I feel like I've got at least 24,000 left in me if God has it. But 12,786 days, and Proverbs says wisdom comes from knowing that and counting every single one of those and saying every one of those days matters. Every one of those days has great significance for me as I follow Christ. You know, numbering our days, I think it gives us wisdom for a few reasons. I think the first one is because numbering our days will teach us to redefine success. And we redefine it from asking the question, what am I accomplishing and what am I achieving, to asking who am I becoming and who am I helping? Numbering our days gives us wisdom because it changes our hearts to become more grateful. That you have this sense of gratitude, not just again like when you make it another year, but that I've made it another day. You know, I followed a uh, NFL wide receiver named Demarius Thomas on Twitter for a long time. And he actually recently passed away unexpectedly, but I followed him for this reason. Every single day, without fail, he would tweet out these words, I wanna thank God for another day. And it was as if he woke up knowing that I'm here, and if my heart is still beating, then my life still has meaning, and I wanna thank God that I'm here. I don't wanna just wake up and take for granted the fact that I'm still breathing, that I'm still going. Thank you, God, that I woke up this morning. Every morning, our life has new meaning, and another reason we can be grateful is that every morning our life has new mercies that have overtaken it. The Bible teaches us that his mercies are new every single morning. And I always think about the mercy of God, kind of like the tide coming in in the evening. Now this illustration didn't work from the people when I was in New Mexico, but here in the South, you understand this, right? That no matter what you dig all day long and what you build, that tide is coming in overnight and when it washes away in the morning, it's like it never happened. Every night we are overwhelmed by the tide of grace and mercy. And I just wonder if there's anybody in the church today that's thankful that every day I wake up and I've got meaning and every day I wake up and I've got mercy that I need and the grace of God that I need. See, if we number our days, we're wise because it changes what we do with our money, how we're generous. It changes how we treat people in our everyday life. It changes how we choose to forgive and how we seek forgiveness from others. Because if you realize that I gotta be thankful that I just made it another day, if I'm reminded of the brevity of life, you know what, we, we realize I don't have time to hold a grudge. I don't have time to hold on to something, but I need to forgive, and then I need to forgive again, and then I need to keep on forgiving. There are a lot of people who are sitting in great pain in their life right now because they were unable to forgive somebody who has now passed away. There are people living in great pain because they were unable or unwilling to seek the forgiveness they needed from somebody who is now no longer here. 
Now, the good news is that God can still forgive you and God can still wipe that shame away from you. But can I just tell you, you don't have time to hold a grudge. You don't have time to hold on to things that Jesus says, I need you to let go of and I need you to let go of it now. The brevity of life helps us to remember that. And finally, it changes the way that we evangelize. I know everybody in this room probably knows somebody that doesn't know Jesus. And I think as Christians, that should bother us. That should impact us. That should keep us up at night. But we have to remind ourselves, as many of us are just pushing that ball further and further down the field, like I got time, I'm still building that relationship, but there may come a point where you don't have another opportunity to tell them, and there may come a point where they don't have another opportunity to hear. So when we understand the brevity of life, it'll change the way we live every aspect of our life. The third and final thing that James brings up, and the band's gonna come and join me. So he says, live in view of God's sovereignty, live in view of our own mortality, then he says, live in view of of eternity. If you're with me this morning, everybody one time say eternity. We want to live in view of eternity. Now, to give this point, I want to steal an illustration from a pastor named Francis Chan that he gave about 15 years ago now, and I want to give credit where credit is due. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that uh, this rope here extends for an infinite amount of distance. that It actually doesn't just end right there behind that speaker. That's just a facade. This goes on forever, right? South through Alabama, through the Gulf of Mexico, the, the ocean, and just wraps around the world an infinite number of times, okay? Is everybody with me on that? Are we using our imaginations? Now, this rope, this white part, that's what's gonna represent eternity. If you wanna just stay up in bed at night having an existential crisis, just think about how, like, it's never going to end. Just messes with me so bad. And then... If you look at this blue part here, this represents our life. In the scope of eternity, this is our life. Everything that we know, everything we sense and feel, everything that we're concerned about, that we're striving for, is here. Every moment, I can can see my own life on this little timeline here, like right here, the moment I was born, July 19th, 1989. And then over here, where I went to elementary school, got into middle school, where I tried out for the middle school basketball team in sixth grade, and I didn't make it. And then I tried out again in seventh grade, and I didn't make it again. And then the next day, where I just gave up basketball forever. Now, if I touch a basketball, I just weep. I cry. I have a lot of sensitivity about it. And then I look at where I graduated high school, where in the summer of 2010, this girl named Delaney McKee walked into our young adult ministry in this blue sundress, and light was just beaming on her from the heavens. And I looked, and I said, God, I choose her. And then 2013, when I married that girl. In 2017, when I had my first kid. 2018, my second kid. 2020, my third kid. Which explains why I'm over here right now and I'm just tired. I haven't slept in seven and a half years. Pray for me, church. Here's what's really interesting, though. I don't know what part of this blue tape that I'm in right now. It feels like I'm over here. Like, I still got, I still got a lot of ground to go. But I don't know where I'm, I'm at right now. So the first priority of the life of anyone, this is why as Christians we want to have this urgency about us to evangelize and tell people about Jesus, is that in this space here, somewhere here, we've got to encounter the risen Jesus, surrender our life to him so that we can have the hope of eternity. Right? And it's with Christ that reminds us and reveals to us that there's more to live for than just this portion. If we want to have eternity, we've got to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But here's the trouble. Most humans, including Christians, all we ever live for is this. And we completely forget about the reality that once we're done with this life, which is a vapor, that we will be walking into eternity. We cannot become so obsessed with this that we forget about this. As Christians, you're going to have people that think you're crazy for some of the decisions you make. That you go to church on Sundays, the way that you are generous and you give your money, the way that you make decisions, the way that you date, the way that you model marriage, like some of the decisions you make, people are going to think you're crazy. They're going to be, are you crazy for what you're doing? And then you need to look at them and say, are you crazy? I'm not living for the sake of this. I'm living, living for the sake of eternity. There is something bigger and greater than what I'm doing now. And I'm not just living for the now, I am living for then. Now, even as I say this, maybe some of you have heard the phrase before that you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Have you ever heard that before? And I think that can happen. I I agree with that in some form or fashion. That sometimes people can become so obsessed with eternity and so obsessed with the idea of heaven that they actually aren't much good for what they need to be doing here on this earth. 
But our lives here are significant. They're short, but they're significant. And I think that there are people that, because they're so focused on eternity, they can think like this. They'll, they'll look at the world and the problems that we see and go, okay, well, I don't need to really engage that. I don't need to really wade into that and fix that because you know, someday all of this brokenness will be made right in eternity. So we're just gonna pray and just let God do his thing in eternity. But can I tell you that Jesus told us that we're not waiting for the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is here now. So that when we do things as followers of Christ, when we love others, when we give to others, when we fight for justice, when we give mercy, when we give hope to our world, we're actually, we actually reach into eternity and we begin to bring more of eternity and more of heaven to earth now. That's why we can say in this world as it is in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We bring it here now. So I'm not, I'm not asking you and telling you to become so obsessed with heaven that you're no earthly good, but to have a view of eternity that says, I'm not just living for this life. And as I look to heaven, it's actually gonna make me more effective here on this earth. This is what C.S. Lewis said. He said, if you read history, you will find out that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Let's not be people who aim at earth. Let's be people who aim at heaven. If you guys would stand to your feet today, I wanna pray for us and just give an opportunity for those of you that we're still in that blue portion. We haven't reached eternity. But to even get to that rope, to even get to eternity, we have to know Jesus Christ is our savior. I wanna use a quick analogy that I gotta admit is a little bit cheesy on the front end here. Um, a lot of my analogies as a dad actually come from Disney. Uh, I don't know if there's any Disney fans in the house. But I wonder if you've seen the movie Coco. I've seen it about 100 times because for a year of my daughter's life, every morning she came downstairs and just said, Coco. And I was like, why not? Let's go ahead and watch it again. I've seen this movie 100 times. It's an interesting movie because in this film, in order to achieve a ter eternal life and to have a great afterlife, the entire thing is wrapped around that you have to be remembered by people on earth, that you have to live a significant way here, that there's gotta be people that know your name, remember your name, and so long as you're remembered here, you can thrive there in eternity in the afterlife. But can I tell you, it's pretty much completely opposite of what the Bible teaches us about eternity. Because you having eternal life has nothing to do with whether people on this earth remember you and everything to do with does God remember you? Do you have a relationship with him? He says, he says there's gonna be some people that have deceived themselves and when they stand before God someday, they're gonna act like I knew you and what's he gonna say? Depart from me because I never knew you. I don't remember you. And we get this so backwards and twisted. As humans, we live for other humans. We, we strive for recognition and fame and popularity and prestige. Guys, I live in a city that has these massive monuments to these men and women who have achieved great things. But I had this really weird moment recently where I was standing at the Lincoln Memorial, this amazing tribute to Abraham Lincoln on the west end of the National Mall. And I, I had this thought, Abraham Lincoln has no idea this is here. His final memory in life was at a play, he was laughing at a funny moment and that's the last thing he remembers. He doesn't even know if we won the war. He doesn't know that people view him as this significant historical figure. We remember him, but if he is in heaven with Jesus, it's not because we remember him, it's because God remembers him. And that's what I wanna get to today. And I wanna ask you that question, does, does God know you? He says the only way to get there is by surrendering to him acknowledging Jesus Christ as our Lord, as our Savior. And the Bible says our name is written in the Lamb's book of life where it cannot be erased. And we will now have the forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternity.